So yeah, what we'll do is we'll just do the um, finish the lecture that we started, and then we'll um, uh, we've got a lecture two there, and then we'll do this critical thinking exercise. Now, in the previous class, although the team said, "Well, can we have a Dropbox for that? We'd like to do that. That's fine. We'll work through the critical exercise together if we have time." And uh, the critical thinking exercise is just to get you to sort of. You know, it's like mental exercise, I guess you could say. And uh, mental exercise and thinking in a logical way, which is very useful for being somebody who's going to write computer programs, right? So uh, uh, in this course, we actually talk about computational thinking, right? Which is uh, thinking in a way so that you can structure your problems so that they could be solved using a computer. And so the critical thinking exercise could help in that, I think. So I think I've got here somewhere... Uh, probably in my downloads, um, the exercises for today. Yeah, so let's look at lecture one there. And we 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 um, actually went through most of lecture one last lesson. And so I'm not going to go through all the stuff that we went through before. So we talked about all of this, remember, from last lesson. But what I do want to show you is that uh, I'm now displaying not just the... Um, not just the, the uh, slide, but the notes that go with the slide. So you see down the bottom there, the notes that go with the slide. And on many of the slides, you'll have a link to a YouTube video. So there's, there's a nice background uh, that you can go and look for yourself. There is useful stuff there. That's found in the PowerPoint. It's not found in the um, PDF file. And so uh, I have put onto your, um, your D2L page, I have put both the PDF and the PowerPoint. Um, now, I, I will ask you with the PowerPoint, you know, sort of don't make a big thing about the PowerPoint because I know that other teachers, particularly the lead instructor, doesn't like students to have the PowerPoints, but I'm giving it to you. The only reason why I'm giving it to you is so that you got those links, okay? Um, so the reason why they uh, some lecturers don't like you to have the PowerPoints, I think is because you could modify them and, and then distribute them in a modified form. So just don't do that. Okay, you know, just use them as a, it, I, I would really just appreciate, do it as a favor to me, just don't tell anybody about it, right? They're there, you can use them, but don't sort of spread them around. All right, so um, Pascaline, and then I've got that all recorded down, how great is that? Um, so as I said, so here we have the Jackard's Loom, and I made a few notes about, uh, a few statements about Jackard's Loom, but there's there's uh, an explanation there in a video if you wanted to get, you know, somebody who spent a lot more time thinking about it and talking about it. There's a nice explanation for a lot of these things. Again, for Babbage's engine, there's a video there. There's a nice explanation of, of how, the, how Babbage's machines worked. Um, there's a video about, about uh, Lady Lovelace, is her name right? Ada, Ada Lovelace. I think we do call her Lady Loveless. She was part of the nobility in, um, in the UK at the time. And again, so there's uh, a lot of sort of extra notes there and videos that I think could be helpful to you if you want to look at that. And these things do show up in the quiz and the exam. So I hope that will help. Now, we did go past all of this. There's a bit about Alan Turing, um, these mainframe, early mainframe computers. This is about where we stopped where we got to the Van Neumann architecture and the fetch, decode, and execute cycle. So that's about where we stopped. So that's where we, I'll just uh, pick up from there. Uh, so uh, Van Neumann came up with this idea. Do you see in the note there that there's this concept of a stored program and a stored... Uh, so that means that we have to have some kind of computer memory. And we see in this Van Neumann architecture a memory unit, which is associated with the... Um, uh, the control unit, the CPU, CPU, this is the CPU, right? The CPU actually has a memory unit in it. And so that's necessary if you're going to take a line of code, read it, and so fetch it. When you fetch it, you're putting it into, you're taking that from the input and you're putting it into that memory. And then we're going to decode it. And uh, then we're going to execute it. And the result of the execution could go back into the memory unit to be used again, or it can go as output. And so the Van Neumann ar architecture is des described there. And I think we did talk about that last time. So let's get going on the rest of this. Um, 
we've got a few slides there about a number, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but there's a number of sort of mainframe computers that were early in the computing age. So when I say the computing age, I mean when we started using electrical computers, electronic computers, so after 1944. And so yeah, yeah here they are, the Remington Rand had one. Um, the, the US presidential election was predicted uh, in 1952 using a computer. Uh, they used um, assembler language, and there's a little bit of code there of assembler language, and we saw that in the previous slide. Uh, then Gr Admiral Grace Hop Hopper, so, I don't think she ever had a ship that she commanded, but she was an admiral in the in the U.S. Navy um, because of her uh, expertise in computing, and so she actually developed a, a computer language, which is quite a famous computer language and was the standard business language in computing uh, for decades, uh, called COBOL. Uh, when I went to university in the 1980s, I learned how to program in COBOL. So uh, the banks were all using COBOL for 20, 30 years, right? Uh, all those old computer, computer systems uh, from the 50s and 60s, not all of them, but many of them were written in, in COBOL. COBOL Fortran for, Fortran for engineers, um, COBOL and for uh, business people. Uh, it's very, very good language. And of course, not just business people, it was developed by a Navy person, right? For use in the US Navy. And okay, so these fellows here are famous for the uh, concept of the integrated circuit. So that's Robert Noyce and Jack Kirby, um, the integrated circuit microchip. So we have different kinds of microchips. We have microchips that could be a processor chip. We have microchips that could be a memory chip. If it's a memory chip, it might be one of these called a DRAM, a dynamic random access memory chip. And um, there's various versions of these, DDRAM, et cetera. Uh, you, you, if you get into sort of hardware, you'll get to know them a, a lot better, but uh, that is where we store our random access memory, which is the memory which is live and accessible in the computer while it's operating. Now, nowadays, our secondary storage memory, uh, which used to be stored on hard drives and floppy drives or magnetic uh, media, or else on a CD-ROM or something. Nowadays, that tends to be on a um, on a on a solid-state chip. So you have SSDs, uh, and that's fast. It's almost as fast. It's, I mean, the technology is very similar to this chip, but what what makes it uh, different that it's not quite as fast as the RAM is that it doesn't have the bus uh, with the same speed to it. So. I don't know if you guys are going to do any computer hardware. If you do, you'll learn all about that, computer buses, um, et cetera. Uh, but the bus is a communication link between, the, between the, the device inside the motherboard and the CPU. And your uh, DRM, your DRAM memory, that is right next to the, to the CPU. And so the distance and, is very short, and the bus is a very fast bus. Um, with other other components. What is buses? What is buses? You just mentioned fastest. No, you just said buses. Bus. What is a bus? I think that's what you're asking me. Yeah. What is a bus? Um, so a bus is a bunch of parallel wires, I guess you could say, in the computer that communicate between one part of the computer and the other. So we call it a bus. It's got to be parallel wires. So they're all going in the same direction, carrying the same thing. And so that's how different parts of a motherboard uh, communicate with the CPU. And that's important, right? And so the closer that those two components are and the wider the bus, the faster the communication. And so the buses come in different speeds. And so the speed between your RAM bus and your other components bus is faster. Uh, uh, the RAM bus is faster. And so that's kind of important. Uh, but I mentioned the uh, SSDs, solid straight drives. Um, an example is this, right? I mean, we actually have memory on this, a lot of memory. I mean, you can buy a, uh, a Samsung phone with a terabyte of memory. I mean, you know, so that's got to be an SSD because it can't have any moving parts in here, right? Um, so the old memories had, had a lot of moving parts. Um, people buy... Um, laptop computers nowadays, most of them you're gonna buy them without moving parts. So it's not gonna have a hard drive in it. And the SSD is more expensive, but it's also faster. 
and a hard drive. All right, so these numbers you should know a little bit about, uh, the idea that there's eight bits in a byte. So a bit is your, is your atomic unit of computing. So when I say atomic, that means you can't make it any smaller, right? The smallest unit in computing can be a bit. And a bit is either yes or no. It's either true or false. It's either zero or one. It, it's zero or one, but it, but it could mean yes or no, true or false, but it's zero or one. And uh, you can get eight lots of zeros and ones together and that gives you a byte. So eight, so it's a bit is two, two times two would be the number of combinations you could have if you had two bits. If you had three bits, you could have two times two times two. If you had eight bits, you could have two times two times two, eight times, right? Or two to the eight. Uh, and if you know that number, that would be 256. You can have 256 combinations of, eight, of, uh, of bits in an eight bit byte. And so the eight bit byte is actually used in computing a lot. That's where we use our ASCII code. Our ASCII code is uh, 256 different combinations of zeros and ones that we use to represent the letters of the alphabet and our numbers and some special characters. And so that's very useful to us, I suppose. Anyways, if you put a thousand of those bytes, those eight bit things together, then you're gonna get a, a kilobyte. So a kilobyte would be about one A4 page of typing words uh, where each where each character is a is a byte a b c yeah. so uh, one page without pictures in it you know if just you typing would be about a kilobyte uh, but of course nowadays we we don't we don't settle for that we're into a much more graphical sort of thing and and that's possible because computer memory has become so much cheaper and processing has become so much cheaper. So people are doing things with a lot of images in them. And of course, you know, you would know that depending on the, um, the depending on the resolution of your camera and how you save the image, if you had a fairly, if you had an image from like five, 10 years ago that was taken on a, a digital camera, uh, a single image would probably be about a megabyte. And uh, of course, nowadays we have people taking, and, and you can also, you can take an image with a very high resolution camera that like you find in your ca in your uh, phones nowadays and you can save it to be smaller so sometimes we have to do that because we're in a situation where we're trying to send something over an internet and we got a slow link or something like that and you know some what i noticed in our um in our uh outlook is what we're using as our uh, uh, our email package here at the college it says that you, you've got a limit i think of two two gigabytes which is that's a lot right uh you know if you have a if you have an attachment size bigger than that it won't allow it um, it used to be like one megabyte i'm not sure about that number i think that's something that i saw you might want to check that right but what is the limit on your um, thing it might not be that much a gigabyte is going to be so a megabyte is a thousand times a kilobyte, right? So a mil million is a thousand times a thousand, and a gigabyte is a thousand times a num uh, times a million. And so, yeah, that's those are the types of numbers that represent the memory that you have in your computers nowadays. Uh, people have computers that are running a memory of eight or sixteen or thirty-two uh, gigabytes of RAM. Um, a terabyte. That's going to be a thousand times a gigabyte and so a terabyte would be yeah you can get that much memory on your computer i have i have to go back i don't think that you can send an email with a gigabyte on it it must be must be a cock up couple of megabytes or something i mean you know, imagine what that would do in your network anyway so a, a terabyte is going to be a thousand gigabytes uh you can get that much on uh, space on your computers nowadays without any too much trouble when I started working, I, I used to work in a phone company in an information technology department in the phone company. And um, we, the phone company had many divisions. And uh, in the information technology department, we used to supply computers, computing services to the other divisions. And we used to sell on a monthly basis to our customers terabytes of storage. <laughs> and we'd charge them thousands of dollars a month <laughs> for 
terabyte storage. So, I mean, it was expensive back in the day, right? Uh, okay, so that's like 35 years ago or something like that. And now you can go down to car four and buy a terabyte, right? <laughs> For hardly anything, right? Well, it, it's gonna cost you a bit. A uh, thousand times that is gonna be a pet, petabyte. And I think you're in the realm of mainframe computers at that point for sure. All right, so this fellow Gordon Moore, there's a, there is a photo of him there, but he was an Intel guy, I think. So you may have heard of Intel. Intel designed a lot of the chips that are in your, um, your personal computers. If you look in, your, if in the specification of your computer, you, you'll, not all of them, there's a lot that have uh, other ones, um, AMDs, but um, Intel ha is found in many computers and they, they come in various versions. You'll see in the specification, you got an i5 or an i7 or an i3. And um, yeah, so Intel's been doing that for quite a long time. And what this fellow noticed, so sort of back in 1968, is that every couple of years, uh, the, the advancement in the field was going so fast that like his law was that in two years, what you did today, you'll do in two years for half the price or for the same price, it's, it's the same law really, for the same price, two years from now, you'll get twice as much power. And that's been kind of true uh, basically since the sixties. And so uh, we, we see that, uh, and, and also things get smaller. Uh, the idea of this slide, I think, is to show you the graphic user interface. It started out not being too fancy, the Macintosh operating system in 1980-something, uh, um, as opposed to a what we see down here would be a command line sort of oper interface. A command line interface, you wouldn't have a mouse. Everything has to be typed. Um, we still have command line interfaces. Uh, this course is not about that, but you know, what the heck. Uh, this is how we used to deal with computers. You know, you'd have, instead of a Z, it would say uh, C. And these are the type of commands you'd give, like DIR, which is show me, uh, show me all your directories, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's how we used to do computing before we got to graphical user interfaces. And as I said, people still do it. You see, I can pull that up. It's embedded into the Windows operating system. Why? Because if you are a, um, a hardware uh, technician, uh, you, you, you might want to be uh, working using that interface. Uh, you can write scripts and stuff like that. And if any of you decide to do hardware, you, you might find yourself working with that type of interface. It's kind of fun. That's, that's the interface that I first saw when I started computing because this was a bit later. IBM had their own. Uh, so yeah, so these kind of famous people, uh, Steve Jobs and his friend, Steve Wozniak, who worked together to make the Apple computing company. And uh, as it says here, Steve Jobs was involved in some other companies too, uh, not Xerox Park, that's another one. And it doesn't say his other companies. He, he made Next because, you know, Steve Jobs was actually fired from Apple when uh, Apple was a public company and they, Steve Jobs, he was really sort of the he was trying to pull the company in the direction of being very art artistic, you know? And so there's drawing programs and really nice fonts and all that kind of stuff. And they had a little bit of trouble sort of in the middle of their life cycle there. I guess that was just before the nineties and, and uh, they fired him, you know, and brought some other people in and he went off and did something else he did next. And uh, then the company didn't do very well and they hired him back. And then he comes up with these great ideas like the iPhone, what a winner that was for him, right? And then way they go again. And then he died. Sorry about that. <laughs> you knew that, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, Bill Gates, he's not dead. And uh, Paul Allen, as far as I know, he's actually the CEO of the company now. So Bill Gates is actually retired from Microsoft. Uh, Bill Gates never, never, you're going to do something that Bill Gates never did which is you're going to get a degree in computing, which Bill Gates never got. That might surprise you. Uh, Bill Gates went to two years of university at the Harvard University studying computing, or was it MIT? One of those. And uh, he was pretty smart. And halfway through that, he had this business opportunity that was presented to him, you know, 
Bill, would you like to sort of, there's this thing, it's like an open contract. Would you, do you think you could do it? Could we write a operating system for the new IBM personal computer? And, you know, so a couple of college guys, they said, yeah, we'll do that. And they just stayed up all night for a few weeks, I suppose. I don't know. But they came up with a new operating system for the IBM personal computer and they went and sold it to IBM and they never went back to university, right? They're too busy sort of just making money after that. Um, now, so he didn't go to university, as you might say, because he didn't need to. Uh, Bill Gates started doing computing when he was like 13 years old. His dad was, I think, uh, associated with the uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, University of Washington had like the best computer learning lab in like the country. And Bill Gates just go up there and write little programs. He wrote a little program. He's like 13, 14 years old that he gave to the Seattle um, city council or police that helped them manage their, their traffic lights and stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, this is kid, right? So, I mean, you know, so I, I, I needed to make that point. Yeah, he didn't have a degree, but he had, he had a lot of good experience in computing. He knew how to do computing. There's no, no problem with his computing. And he's a pretty smart guy anyways. Uh, so some of the devices that sort of came out, uh, these guys at Stanford. Stanford features very, Stanford features a lot. It's a university that's at the center of Silicon Valley. You've heard of Silicon Valley? Silicon Valley in San Jose, uh, where a lot of companies are. Uh, so when I say a lot of companies are there, I mean like Google. Uh, I don't know about Facebook. Facebook might be in Seattle. Um, uh, Microsoft's in Seattle. Uh, but, you know, in that area, there's a lot of these... Um, and uh, so people go and live there so that they can work in computing and they get huge salaries. And so it's a really expensive place. But Stanford, the university, uh, what it's kind of famous for is, it, is what happens is there's a lot of rich people that, will, that are investors and they're looking for a way of making money, which is better than the other ways that they've found. And, and one way of making money for a rich investor is can you find somebody with a really good idea to make a new company like Google or something? You know what I mean? And so uh, they have a lot of these rich investors that are keeping their eye on Stanford and they'll go there and they'll meet with the students there. And if students come up with a good idea, they can maybe get a business going. And uh, so a lot of these companies, that's how they got started, just at Stanford. The smart people meeting the rich people, right? And then out comes a big company. And uh, so a few of the companies that we'll see here, that, that, that's how that happened. Um, yeah, the internet is another story. The Department of Defense, the United States government, they uh, do a lot of research and they have uh, different labs in different parts of the country, com country. And so back in the 60s, some of these guys decided they wanted to be able to talk to each other and they had computer network and they, had, they developed some ways of um, communicating over that network. But first they had to, the network had to be able to, to um, carry that communication. And so they developed protocols that were become the basis of our internet. And then there's some other history there about that. So yeah, the internet, now the internet, the way we think about it, where um, public utility telephone companies started, started um, selling the internet to retail, to retail customers like us, that sort of happened in um, uh, the early 90s, I guess. That's when I first saw it, when I was first offered by a telephone company, do you want to get this internet? Uh, yeah, and so with dial-up modems and that kind of stuff. Bill Gates, as I said, smart guy. He doesn't do too much computing nowadays. He's sort of retired and gone on to other things. Uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they invented Google and the next couple slides about that. Sergey Brin was in the news yesterday in the last week. You guys see it? Okay, I, I won't say too much about it. Let's just uh, Google and find out about Sergey Brin and Elon Musk. Nice, fun story. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Google is a word that means a big, big number, one with a hundred zeros. And so the idea being that we've got this system that, um, that can just, uh, we can use it to index lots of stuff. Like for example, every web page on the internet. If we could index every web page on the internet, then our search tool could be able to find 
well, using all kinds of algorithms. And it's, it's not as simple as, as me just saying it sounds, right? I mean, you know, if you go to Google, they've got a lot of really smart people there have been working on that for like 10, 15 years to get it tuned the way it is. Um, but uh, yeah, basically that people can fairly quickly find things by using a, using a search and that things are pre-indexed uh, so that, you know, they come up quickly. Very nice job they did on that. And uh, yeah, okay, so there's some history. And what we see is, yeah, it goes on. Apple introduces the iPad. We could go on from there. There's a lot of stuff that happened since then, I guess. So any questions on that? No. Questions? Let's look at the second lecture uh, here, which is, uh, and we'll just continue on with this, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, because I'm not going too fast, am I? No. These are all familiar to you too, right? For me, the thing that jumps out there is the improvement in the screens. So, I mean, all these screens are pretty awesome. Uh, you know, we've, we've got LED technology, it doesn't use very much energy, but it gives nice bright thing, you know, and so great uh, compared to the huge TV screen kind of thing that we used to, that we used to have, you know, it used a lot of power and it was huge and heavy. And so these things here may be familiar to you too. Probably somebody here has got a watch, which is a um, smartwatch um, that you're not allowed to use during exams. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> Why you're not allowed to use it? Because you know, you can, if you had good eyes, you could sort of read a book on it, I suppose, which could be all the answers to the test. So yeah, so that's pretty smart. I mean, the smartwatches, they're pretty good now. They do a lot of stuff. Uh, basically, almost everything that you can do with your phone. And a lot of people, of course, they connect their smartwatch to their phone using uh, Bluetooth or whatever. And there's a lot of connection and stuff going on inside a, uh, inside a normal home nowadays, I suppose. Um, so Internet of Things thing, that uh, all of your systems could have uh, IP addresses. IP addresses, how you identify a, um, um, uh, what do we call it, a, a node on the network. Uh, so that could be a, uh, a, a computer or some other device. So you could have an IP address on something as simple as, like it says there, a light bulb switch or a light bulb could have an IP address. And if it's got an IP address, that means it's accessible over the internet. And uh, then, then you can control it somehow with some program. So you could sit in your office uh, here at the college or university and uh, you could turn on the lights at home, you know, and turn on the baby monitor, you know, the camera, or it's on all the time, but you could view it. Uh, you could turn up the AC or turn the AC down you could lock all the doors, all this kind of stuff you can do um, because of, of that. So it talks about embedded devices, et cetera. Check the stuff in your fridge <laughs> so, so that you, you, you know what to go shopping for, that kind of stuff. Now, um, we have this concept of a um, personal area network. So just briefly, you may have heard of a, a LAN, local area network, right? And uh, then there's the idea of a metropolitan area work network, or a MAN. Then there's a wide area network, which is a WAN. And now, but there is this, this concept of a PAN, a personal area network. A personal area network would, would include many devices that might connect uh, to maybe some central device that are associated with your person. And so you could put a lot of sensors on a person. This would be really good in medicine. And this is where this really came up. Uh, so you could have people at home that um, need medical care, need medical monitoring, but it's a lot cheaper to keep them at home. And they're happier to be at home, right? I mean, who wants to be in a hospital, right? And so they, they, they could stay at home and they could, be, they could be totally monitored. And if one of the monitors on them, it could be like monitoring their heartbeat or monitoring their breath or monitoring their temperature or anything that you can monitor. You know, uh, you know it could even be monitoring through your skin, your oxygen content in your blood. Excuse me, apparently they can do that. So um, without, without invasive, right? Just putting a sensor on your skin, they can measure the, the uh, oxygen content. That's how that works? It tells you your oxygen thing? Yeah. See, there you go. So uh, if you have that, and, and now this is just easy to do, right? You could have a little app running on your phone, which contacts your, through the internet, contacts your doctor if there's anything which is a problem. Right? And then your doctor could intervene 
and you know prescribe something or get get a uh, ambulance out to you or whatever and so people's lives could be saved doing that i suppose um we've got oh the smart tv the new tvs tend to be that right so uh basically it's just like another internet device and so you can run your netflix on it without you know, you know it's just there right it's 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 actually connected to your wi-fi device at home and people play games I'm not going to say too much about that okay so the printer here is worth talking about because for example here at the college uh the teachers we've got lots of teachers here in the it department um but we don't have a lot of computers uh, sorry printers we all tend to use the same printer and so that must be because it's a networked computer right the, the, the uh, printer is connected to the network and we access it through the network and uh, so we can all use the same printer uh, that means that we get a higher quality print and it costs the college less money because we don't have to have a printer in everybody's office. Got some other devices there uh, for storage, network storage device. And we've got a server. Um, there's more than one server there, I think. So we've got a um, cabinet, a server cabinet with several servers in it. And uh, actually, if we went down to the data center, we call it data center here. Which is, a, which is attached to building three. Uh, they, you could go down there and you could see several cabinets like this uh, that contain all of the servers that we use to run our PeopleSoft. I don't know about D2L, I think B2L is in the cloud, um, but yeah, definitely our PeopleSoft is, is here. That one's running here at the college. And so this is what I mean by in the cloud. Uh, you, there are these very large data centers uh, in places like Ireland and Iceland, um, companies like Google and uh, Amazon and uh, they and other companies like that, they they run server farms there and they rent out um, part of the, um, what, what do I want to call it? They, they rent out the service on that on that uh, servers uh, to companies. So they, they benefit, why would a company go and rent some time and space on the Google servers in Ireland or Iceland, uh, rather than just build their own data center uh, where they live. Well, th there is some situations where you just want to have your own data center. I mean, you're running a bank, you know, you, you want to have a data center because you need to be as secure as possible. You don't want anybody else touching that stuff. Uh, the other one would be for your military. Uh, so your, the, the computers that are controlling your military communications, stuff like that, you don't want that to be in some other country where somebody else might get their hands on it, right? You know, this is your military, that's for protecting your country. Um, that would, and for your telephone communications company, like Orito, they wouldn't want to have their servers anywhere else because actually that is like a military asset. Um, so banks, military, but other companies, you know, you, you're a, um, just a uh, commercial company, it could save you a lot of money. Uh, if you didn't have to build a big data center for your business, you could just use the data center that, that Google has or, or AWS has, and you could rent it on a per month basis. You can say, okay, I need this much, this much. And so if you've got a business that you're starting off and you expect your business is going to grow, you know, that might be a really good way to do it. You left something behind? Yeah, yeah, I have yeah welcome. So, um, so that's not mine. maybe that's yours. Is that yours? I think so. Yeah, they all look the same, right? <laughs> um, if, you're, you, if your business is growing from month to month, you know, this month, this month, as you start up, you don't need too much computing. And so your rental costs will be less. And then you realize, oh, look, I'm getting all of these customers. I better get some more computer power. No problem. You just call up the guys at you know, AWS. You say, okay, let, double that or triple that. Or, okay. And then maybe your business falls into hard times and you have to close your business down. No problem. Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to close that contract. We're not going to do that anymore. And, and your monthly bill stops as opposed to you building your own data center and you, know, you, you fill it full of computers and you spend millions of dollars and then... Six months later, you have to close it down. Oh, you know, you're, you're going to be bankrupt. So it, it, we call that scalability, right? Scalability is where you take your system and just make it bigger um, or smaller uh, over time and definitely sort of um, on the cloud 
computing would help with that. Oh, what's a computer? It's not that person that, uh, that adds up all the columns at the bottom of the accounting sheet, right? It's uh, all these things that you know, I think that that's a obvious thing. Now this graph here shows power or number of transistors, there you go. The number of transistors, which is related to the power of the chip. And uh, the, down the bottom is the dates. And along the side is the scale. And if you look at the scale, you'll see that's a, a logarithmic scale. Logarithmic scale is increasing. So like each little um, moving from one to the next one, that's not increasing by one. That's increasing by 10 times. No, it's not increasing by 10. It's increasing by 10 times the amount of the one before, right? You get the idea? Is it? No, it's, a, it's two times at the top there. Yeah, it's semi-logarithmic. Um, but so if this was uh, on a scale, which was each, you know, it was the same, then the, then the graph would look like it was going straight up. And so we use a, a, a logarithmic scale or an E scale so that we can turn this into a line that we can see. The number of tr transistors has increased that, that fast. And so the number of transistors is related to how much memory it can store and also how much uh, how fast the operations can be on the on the CPUs. And there's another one. Now this one is definitely logarithmic. You can see that. One, this is 10 times that, that's 10 times that. That's 10. So as we go up from unit to unit, it's 10 times one below. And and from that we get a kind of a line. That's kind of a state line. That's that's the speed. That's how the speeds have increased on our computers over time. And that's just since 1995. And there was a lot of computing before 1995. Um, the next few slides are going to be about the progression where we are now. Some of you are doing, um, are gonna be doing the degree in AI, maybe, I don't know. So if you are, then you might be interested, well, what is AI? How long have we been working on it? Will we ever get there? And so with, there has been some applications. So for example, in 1997, there was a IBM had a computer with a program which was able to beat the world's uh, champion human chess player. So that you could say that must be artificial intelligence. Well, you know, chess, it's hard for us because, you know, that's a lot of stuff to remember. But, you know, for a computer, eh, you know, I mean, that's kind of artificial intelligence in a way that, you know, each, each uh, but the patterns, you know, artificial intelligence has a lot of pattern recognition. This is a fairly narrow thing, right? That computer might be able to beat somebody playing chess, but it's not going to be able to drive your car for you. You know what I mean? It's not going to be able to do a lot of things that just your average person can do pretty well because they focus that computer just to play chess. So that it's not a general intelligence that the, that computer has. We, we say it's got an artificial intelligence, but it's very narrow. All it, what it can do is it can play chess, <laughs> right? And likewise for the Watson thing. You know, so a computer there beats somebody in Jeopardy. You know, Jeopardy is is they is general knowledge questions, right? They ask all of these really, um, you know, uh, I don't know, the, the questions that nobody knows, right? But, but some people actually know them, right? What I mean by that was they, so, okay, I choose sporting, okay, from sporting, okay. In the 1956 test between India and England, um, you know, who was the batsman that got 100 runs, right? You know, well, who knows, right? Well, somebody knows, but it's not the type of thing that, most people know. <laughs> um, so AlphaGo, again, another game where a computer is beating people at games. So we've got lots of computers pe beating people at games. And so I guess we're calling that artificial intelligence. Uh, will are, will uh, computers ever be smarter than people? Well, yeah, maybe they'll get the general intel intelligence. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, I've heard said, and I, and I kind of subscribe to this, is that People who are in the arts, people who are art-minded, if you want to say, as, as opposed to sort of linear thinking, um, engineering, science people, who maybe we probably are, because linear thinking, uh, engineering, science people, they do good in computing, right? Because uh, that's what we, we need, a bit of linear thinking. We also need a bit of art thinking, I suppose, like uh, people like um, Steve Jobs. 
But uh, so the arts people, they tend to be not linear thinking so much. They tend to be very open and they tend to actually be very forward thinking in a way that science and, and the linear thinking people are less forward thinking. So the, they come up with sort of all these scenarios of what's going to happen in the future, you know. Uh, and so that tends to be, tends to be, it comes to us in the form of art and for example, movies. So the movie that I'm thinking of here is like the Terminator, right? I don't know if you've seen that. There's like three or four Terminators. And uh, the idea in the Terminator is that the, we get to a point sometime a hundred years from now where the uh, computers uh, get to self-actualization, you know, I, sorry, self-awareness. Uh, the computer is aware there in the way that a human is aware, you know? So it's like they have their own identity and they sort of, they're able to sort of uh, think like a person. And so what happened in the Terminator movie is the computers can think like people and they look around and they say, well, you know, this isn't such an ideal thing, right? The people there, they're way too random. They're way too organic. And the way they're behaving is not really good for us computers. So we can, we're, we're at such an advanced state with robots and stuff like that, that we can manufacture ourselves. We don't need these people. And they're actually in the way. And so let's get rid of them. And so that's the sort of the theory behind the uh, Terminator movie. Um, hope it never happens. <laughs> yes, so that that's the thing, right? Uh, if you saw the movie, uh, you know, they have a way around that, you know. That was the idea of it is we have to go back and make sure the computer we don't give the control to the you know that was a, they were traveling in time or something terminator movie that was kind of weird <laughs> uh, John Connor and uh, who's that American he used to be a bodybuilder uh, of course he's got a German name he came from Austria oh. Schwarzenegger yeah I'll be back <laughs> yeah and he was he was the terminator Art Art is his name Art. Arnie, Arnie Schwarzenegger. Yeah, he was the governor of California for a while. Anyway, so that's that. What we've got left is these critical thinking activities. Oh, that doesn't look like it. What's this? All right, there we go. Critical thinking activities. So some of you might recognize this as looking a little bit like a bit of math exercise. I think so. I think if you, uh, you might have done some of this stuff in math before, if you can write an equation, that's useful. And well, that's good because in computing, we, do, we, we can translate math stuff straight into computer programs. We have computer systems that will, uh, will, will just take math straight up. Uh, you can do it in Python. You can do it in C. In the old computer languages like COBOL, you can do mathematics. <coughs> you can do it in Fortran, especially made for it. But you see the pattern, right? See the pattern? So what I notice is whatever this number here is, you got two of them plus one, right? Two of them. So this number is two. So two and two plus one. This number is three. Three and three plus one, right? You get it? So the pattern is fairly straightforward. You can put that mathematically. So you could just say, okay, well, y, or our total number of squares, is equal to 2x plus one, where, where x is the number of of uh, any individual square, uh, sorry, the number here, this is X, and this is Y, our, our number of squares. Does that make sense? You agree with my formula? So that that's, is that critical thinking? Yeah, maybe, <coughs> but, it's, uh, but it's to look at something. Here we're looking at a pattern. Patterns, that's a big thing in computing, and it's a big thing in mathematics. Uh, so uh, we see that, and then we reduce it to something which is simple, computational thinking. The idea of this course, computational thinking, is can we structure our problems, take a problem, structure it in such a way that a computer could be used to solve it? Yeah, I think now we've done that. We could say, well, yeah, that's computational thinking. I structured that in a way that I could answer this question here, which is how many squares would be in the 20th pattern? In the 20th pattern, that would be 2 times 20 plus 1, which would be 41. Right, and get the ideas. Fairly straightforward. Yep, agree? Well, that's that one. Let's go to the next one. Doing this kind of quick because I like to. 
go and do something else, right? You like to just go and do something else too, right? <laughs> All right, so again, do this, and I think that mathematics is the way to use this, right? Then we've got it in a way that a computer can do it. So we got a package of mixed nuts. And what we notice that there's 81 nuts. So we got we can write an equation which says there's 81 nuts. And how many of each type are there? So what we notice is we've got brazil nuts, peanuts, almonds, and cashews. So I'm going to use the symbols A for almonds, B for brazil, C for cashews, and P for peanuts. Okay? All right, so twice as many brazil nuts as cashews. So brazil nuts, the number of brazil nuts is equal to two times the number of cashews. Agree? So that's that. Twice as many peanuts as brazil nuts. So peanuts is equal to um, two times cashew nuts. Another way I could write this because, well, we'll see this in a second. Sorry. Not C, but B. Thank you for that. Uh, peanuts are equal to two times the number of brazil nuts. Agree? Okay, so we got that. Next one. Same number of almonds as brazil nuts. So A is equal to B. Okay. So what do we do with that? We can see that B sort of features in all of those, right? So we can write that the other way around. I can put the, I can make this B is equal to A. And I could make this 2B is equal to P, right? So yeah, okay. We could do something with that, right? Uh, another way of doing that is we could say B is equal to one half of P, agree? 2B is equal to P. So right, twice as many yeah. peanuts, agree? So now we can add that up. We can say, all right, so 81 is equal to B. This is, this is our almonds, this is our cashews. 81 is equal to almonds plus Brazil nuts plus cashews plus P, right? Agree? So they're all together. Or in other words, 81 is equal to almonds is equal to B, right? Yep. And B is just B. B is equal to 2C. Uh, okay. So B is just B. Uh, you could just write 81 is equal to 4B. Four, four and a half B. Okay. 2B plus B plus B. Yes, that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> yes, so, but you're ahead of me. Yes, so um, as you say, you could just add this up. You could say, right, 2B plus B plus B, that's four plus a half. That's a better way of doing it, right? So that's four and a half B. Agree? Just add them up. That's, it's all total. So that's equal to four and a half B, which is equal to, so therefore B is going to be equal to 81 divided by four and a half which is going to be 18. And so then we can we can put that back in there, right? Um, Sorry, but where did you get the half? Where did I get the half? From here. No, the half B. No, I just didn't get it. Uh, because I just inverted this. Twice as many peanuts as brazil nuts. So that means there's half as many brazil nuts as there are peanuts. But we've already written 2B is equal to P, so why yes. would you? Oh, right. Yep. So I can't use it's that twice. 81 is, is equal to 40. Yeah. So 2B uh, is equal no. to P and B is equal to half P is the same. So we don't need to write B is equal to half P again. No, this is, this was, this would have been wrong. 2B is equal to half, it is, yeah, it's actually half P. But I don't know. I know the answer is four and a half. So B is equal to two C. Is that right? There's twice as many brazil nuts as cashews. There's twice as many peanuts. Yeah. So this is now this is two P. Oh, sorry. P is equal to two B. So it wasn't right to put it the other way. Um, P is equal to two B. And so B is equal to a half P. Um, if we go here, P is, P is equal to 2B, right? No, it's B is equal to 2P. B is equal to 2P. Yep. But it's twice as many peanuts as brazil nuts. 
So for us, nuts is equal to twice as many peanuts, right? So B is equal to two B. There's twice as many brazil nuts as peanuts? No, the second point, twice as, as many, many peanuts, peanuts as brazil nuts. So B, brazil nuts, is equal to twice as many peanuts, 2P. Yes, B is equal to 2P. So if B is equal to twice as many peanuts as brazil nuts, no, 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 P is equal to 2B. Twice as many peanuts as brazil nuts. The number of peanuts must be twice as many brazil nuts. The number of peanuts. So, I mean, if B was 18, P is going to be 36. That's twice as many peanuts as brazil nuts. Does that make oh, sense? Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. And so this one here is twice as many um, brazil nuts as cashews. So if there's, if there's, um, what, what's cashews, you know? Uh, However many cashews there are, there's going to be twice as many um, brazil nuts, right? Is that right? Twice as many brazil nuts as cashews. Uh, I worked at, so the cashews is going to be, it's going to be nine cashews, it's going to be 36 peanuts, and it's going to be 18 of each of these. And that'll be our 81. Sorry, it's kind of hard to do that when I'm standing up on the board. Have a try at that on your own and see if you can come up with a better one. But uh, I think if you added those numbers up, 18 plus 18 plus 9 plus 36, right? 36 plus 36, that's 72 plus 9 is 81. It does actually work. Out. All right, so that was a bit tricky. And we got sort of a bit tied up because we were doing things in a sort of an inverted way. Don't worry about that too much. Let's look at this one here. I've actually got that on the board. We solved it in the other class. Uh, yeah, just to save time, I'll leave that there. The idea here is we've got logic, and the, the idea is that you can only be one, you can only have one favorite class. Each, each student can only have one favorite class, and each favorite class can only be by one student. Does that make sense? And then the a student cannot have a favorite class which starts with their same letter as their name. And then there's some other rules. So let's look at the other rules. Bader and the person whose favorite subject is social studies have lunch together. So what that means is Bader's favorite subject cannot be social studies. Does that make sense? Because he's, he has lunch with somebody whose favorite subject is social studies. So that's what I meant by this. I put an X beside Bader with the social studies. Bader cannot like social studies. Fatma and Sammy both like dislike dis dislike experiments in science class. So the science that's here is biology. So neither of them are gonna like biology. So that's why I put here for Fatma and Sammy an X beside, beside biology. They don't like biology, right? Um, and now the other thing that we know is that Sammy can't like social studies because social studies starts with S. And Fatma can't like PE because PE starts with P. Right? You got that idea? That's already that's already there. Uh, Miriam is a very talented athlete. So this is our this is our hook. This is our wedge to get into this problem, right? Uh, that that Miriam is very talented athlete in track and field. So if you like track and field, you probably like PE. That's probably her favorite subject. Well, it wouldn't be her not favorite subject. So we just start off with that. That means nobody else can like PE. Right, that's the logic, right? So Marion likes it, so nobody else could like it because they all can only like one. So that's where we kind of get that. And Sammy jokingly says, I can't draw a straight line. So drawing would be art, right? So Sammy probably doesn't like art because he can't draw. So that's why I put an X beside the A there. So Sammy doesn't like biology, he doesn't like art. Now, Fatma doesn't like um, biology. And she, she can't like PE. I didn't even need to put PE. But she can't like PE because somebody else likes it and because her name starts with P. And so then how do we get the other things? All right, so um, Sammy can't like biology and he can't like art. Uh, PE's already been taken. So what's left was social studies. He can't like social studies um, because uh, he, um, uh, because 
it starts with S, and his name starts with S. So the only one that's left for Sammy is Matt. He couldn't like biology because he said he didn't like biology, right? And uh, he didn't like art because he can't draw. So Sammy gets math, and now we're down to just social studies and um, and uh, biology. Now Fatma can't like biology, so she has to have social studies. So that means that uh, biology must be Ahmed. Does that make sense? So uh, this is process of elim elimination, which is kind of a logic thing. Uh, the marble sing. The marble sing is quintessential computing uh, computing search. So if you had a lot of something, let's say in this case, we've got eight marbles and you wanted to find the lightest marble and you just got a weighting scale. One way you could do it is you could do a sequential search. A sequential search is take the first marble, weigh it, write it down. Take the second marble, weigh it, write it down until you got through the end. But you might, you might have to do eight measures to, to find it. You know what I mean? You might, because... Maybe it's the last one. So that would be eight. And we want to do it in less than eight. And so what uh, computer scientists came up with a long time ago is the idea of the binary search. And so how the binary search is, is you divide the population that you want to search in half. And so what you do here is you uh, uh, in a repetition. So we use loops in computing, right? So we'd, have a, we'd, we'd make a loop and we'd say, we're, we're just going to do this until we get to the one which we want. So we do this. Uh, and the repeated step would be we divide the population in half, weigh both sides, and discard the heavy one because we're looking for the lightest marble. And so the first time you do it, you got eight marbles. And so they, that's going to be four on one side and four on the other. So you take the, there's going to be a heavy side and a light side. Why is there a heavy side and a light side? Because there's one light marble, right? So the, the, the half that's got the light marble is always going to be the lighter side. So we discard, discard the, the heavy one. And we take this one and divide it in half. So we got two and plus two. One of those is going to be heavy. One of those is going to be light. We take the heavy one and discard it. And so we got this, and that's just going to be two marbles. And one of them is going to be heavy. And then we have identified our light marble, correct? And we do that with three steps. One, two, three. A lot quicker than doing it in eight steps. And so that's a binary search. Not sure why that came up, but it, there it is. So we got two more exercises to do. And again, this is a bit of math. Oh, gosh. I actually didn't like this one very much. But, you know, maybe you'll like it more. Um, oh, can I make that bigger? Plus. There you go. So we got these three numbers, four numbers, three, four, six, and eight. And we have to get from them by any combination of adding, subtracting, um, dividing, and um, uh, multiplying. We have to get these three numbers. Now, what you would find is there's more than one way of doing it, all right? There's, so there's more than one way to get 14. There's more than one way to get 10. There's more than one way to get four. And you know, uh, I, I would just sort of come up with my own ways. Uh, I look at that and I say, okay, look, uh, three times four, that's 12, right? Six times eight, that's 48. Divide that by that. So three times four divided by six, sorry, six times eight divided by three times four, that equals four. Agree? So uh, yeah, 48 divided by 12. There's other ways to do it. There's like, I don't know, you pro probably there's five or six ways to do it, but that's that's one way. So that's four. What about 10? Yeah. So how, what combination of these is going to give you 10? It's going to be, again, some kind of thing like that where you're going to do some dividing and, and adding and multiplying. I think I'd start by doing, a, okay, let's take six and divide it by three. So that's going to be two. Now I've got a six and eight. What can I do with that, right? Um, maybe I could add them to the oh no. So can we add two and three? So eight. Mm. So it, now we're now we're left with six and eight. What do we do with six and eight? That is going to give me four. And that's forty-eight. 
tricky. I'm getting too tired. Let me have a look. How did I actually do this? Six divided by three. Well, that's that's my way of getting another way of getting four. Yeah, if you wanted to have another way of getting four, you have six divided by three um, plus eight divided by four. That's another two. You could add those together and multiply them together. That's another way of getting four. Um, but uh, eight plus four. Eight plus four is twelve. Yeah, and then six by three. Can you do that? And then what am I going to do with it? So that's equal to twelve. Then 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 six divided by three is going to be equal to two, and then subtract three. So there we go. That gives us ten. Very good. Thank you. Uh, now the only one we haven't got is 14, right? So we got our four twice, we got our 10, 14. What can we do for 14? The same thing, but I. Okay, so you would do eight plus four to give 12 and six over three to give two and then add them together. Very nice. Okay, so yeah, nice stuff. Last one is this triangle thing. Now, I think I better make that a little bit smaller. You've got these numbers that, can I erase this? I'm gonna erase it. Uh, that won't show up in the video, will it? <laughs> um, so what I noticed about this, when I try it, what I noticed is you, you've got an inner triangle and you got an outer triangle, okay? And so what you have to do to solve this is it, in the outer triangle, um, all of the numbers must be either even or odd. And then all of the inner tri triangle needs to be the opposite. So you can do it. All the outer, outer triangle would be even numbers and the inner triangle would be odd numbers. And that'll give you a number that totals up to an odd number. And so we got two numbers here that we need to do this to, to 67 and to 68. So doing it for the 67, we put in the, in the big triangle, put all of our even numbers, 20, 22, 24. So there's a pattern. I mean, a lot of this is about pattern recognition, right? And then, on, then each side is supposed to add up to 67. So that's not too hard, right? 20 and 22 is 42. And then to add up to 67, you're going to need, what? 25, right? 25 is there, that's one of the numbers. And then this is 24 and 22 is 66. That's uh, sorry, 46 plus 21 is gonna give us 67. And then the number that's left is 23, does that work? 24 and 23 is 47 plus 20 is 67. So that works for that. Now to get that, that all of those, the sides equal 67. Now, if we wanted to get the sides to work to, if we want to get to 68, we just reverse those triangles. And so that our um, outside numbers are odd and our inside numbers are even. 20, that's 44, so that must be 24, right? That'll get us to 68. And there's, can't be 23 twice, this must be 25. And there's uh, 46, and to get to 68, we're gonna do 22. And there's uh, 48, and so that must be 24. All right, so I mean, I went through that kind of quickly. We're all kind of tired, especially me. It's hard to do math when you're tired. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. That's the kind of the end. All right, so any questions on all of that that we kind of sort of looked at? Yesterday, you had a uh, lab to do, and I did put a Dropbox for you. Students in the previous class asked me if I put a Dropbox for this exercise, but I told people they didn't have to do it, so it's optional. But if you want to have a crack at it, if you can remember what I did or if you can do it yourself, that's awesome. Okay, I'm going to stop now.